Hi, and welcome back to the Learning Happy Hour at Palo Alto Networks, episode 35. My name is Luke Teeters. I am a systems engineer for Palo Alto Networks. And I'm Patrick Branley. I'm a security training engineer for Palo Alto Networks. So today we're going to talk about east-west segmentation, right? A lot of companies, they have aspirations to segment their network, but uh, how does that actually occur? How do, how do we actually do that? So what we're going to do is double click into the details, and we're going to show a real world example of how to accomplish this. So I'm going to let uh, Luke guide us through that. Take it away, Luke. Awesome. So let's first start with a problem statement. Um, most networks these days that exist out there in the field don't have a firewall. When you go to the network team and say, hey, I want to put a firewall, they typically say, you know, what does this look like? You know, there's a lot of risk involved here. You know, network teams are more interested in uptime and not necessarily interested in security. So the problem statement from the security side of the house is, you know, visibility, right? right. When we specifically look at the branch, um, if you don't have a firewall at the branch, you're not going to have visibility in and out of the branch. You're not going to have visibility inside the branch itself, right? Most branch right. networks will have multiple networks. Um, yeah. So the, 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 the cherry on top here is then you don't have incident response capability. So, you know, we all see the, you know, ransomware on the news these days. We all see, you know, bad things happening out there in, in the market. Um, if you don't have the ability to do incident response, you're in a bad position uh, right, from yeah. a security perspective, okay? So back to the network team, right? You say, hey, Mr. Network Manager, you know, I wanna put a firewall at the branch and they're gonna say, okay, um, what's the number one cardinal rule? Full redundancy, right? We can't have any sort of uh, single point of failure. Exactly. I like to always yeah. say one is none is, 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 is the word of the day. Who is one, um, one is none, so yeah. yeah. And, you know, we can't do a major network design change, right? Most network teams, um, they have their design. They basically copy and paste that design to all the branch to have consistency. Um, we can't do a major network design. I'm sorry. Like you want to bring the firewall in. That's awesome. Uh, but we can't make an, a major network design and we need to keep it as simple as possible. When we're doing troubleshooting, if there's a failure of power, if there's something out there, you know, we need to keep this as simple as possible. Right. And also consider that that full AJ. Well, I don't I don't so think do, uh, people always uh, kind of appreciate how disruptive even just one layer three device, you know, inserting that into a network requires a a uh, actually a significant change in the traffic flow. So uh, I get why they would be you know concerned about that, but again, it's as you said, uptime versus security. But we need the security and the visibility. So yeah, absolutely. So how do we make everybody happy? So here is a, a basic branch design. This is very high level. So we're not getting into the switch stacks. We're not getting into what the um, actual configuration looks like. But at a high level, this is what something would look like for a standard branch design for an enterprise. Um, typically, you have a router, which also could be a layer three switch. And then you have you know layer two switches that will have the VLANs, right? So right. by VLANs, I mean um, different networks, right? So different. Um, uh, broadcast domains, if you want to think of it that way. So, you know, a standard branch could have a VoIP network, it could have a surveillance network, you know, you could have servers um, at the site, you could have IoT devices, um, and then also your printers and your workstations and that sort of thing. Right. Typically, um, these networks are um, in different VLANs. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, VoIP, obviously, you're going to have quality of service, uh, things like that. Right. For surveillance, you might have a server that it needs access to, um, but you know surveillance devices are just you know segmented off. So, yes, there's segmentation on a VLAN perspective, but we don't have any visibility um, when the office network is talking to the server network. You know, we want to understand, you know, what protocols are being sent, DNS, SMB, you know, NetBIOS, all the different things, and some of these. Um, applications are known for malicious activity, right? If there's ransomware, right. it could be using SMD to, you know, to do cross-lateral movement throughout the environment. We have to stop that. We have to have the visibility. We have to be able to inspect the traffic. We have to be able to stop the threat if something were to occur. Right. So, you know, 
you come to the network team and you say, hey, you know, I want to segment the network. And you say, here's my, my HA pair of firewalls. You know, I bought these firewalls, let's put them in. It's going to give us visibility um, east-west, which is what we're here to talk about today. But it could also give you visibility north-south. What's interesting about Palo is we could actually deploy the Palo firewall in uh, layer three mode, but we could also do a layer one mode, which we call virtual wire. Right. So yeah. I actually, um, so I'm a systems engineer for Palo and I cover customers and I actually have some customers that do virtual wire on their MPLS. So as the, the, the traffic comes in and out of the facilities, out of these branch offices, they actually have the full visibility into what is coming in and going out um, with a virtual wire. So virtual right. wire is, is basically a bump in the line and it's um, we're not participating in routing. We're not participating in, in the switching. It's literally an ethernet cable. If you want to think of it that way with full visibility, what's coming in, what's going out. Well, that's the, you know, this name implies it's a virtual wire. It's just a wire as far as everyone else is concerned. So yeah, it's a, it's a great solution, honestly. So. Right. And actually fun fact, I think um, back in the day when Palo first launched, um, that was the way that we deployed these devices in layer oh, one, yeah. virtual wire. All right, so let's actually take a look at something. Um, I'm going to pull up my lab. So, you know, again, you, you go to the network manager and say, hey, I want to put a firewall in place. And we say, okay, give me a design. So here's the design. Um, we're going to start basically at, you know, the lowest layers and go all the way up. So first thing to consider is power. Uh, the PA220 is what I have in my lab here. Um, which actually has redundant power. So you could actually purchase two power supplies for your PA220 and you'll have power redundancy. This means if a power um, cable is unplugged by mistake or you have a failure, uh, you have a secondary power supply to keep the thing on. <laughs> That's number yeah. one. Um, number two is link redundancy. Um, no one wants a single interface if it, go, if it were to go down to bring the network down. So basically, we're going to get a little technical here. Um, with PanOS, we can actually implement LACP uh, using port aggregate. So as you can see, um, I actually have aggregate uh, one, AE1 inside PanOS, aggregate group one, um, giving me the ability to um, have link redundancy. This means if the intern goes to the back closet, mistakenly unplugs the wrong cable or something happens, right? We're still up and operational because we have two interfaces that are, that are in aggregate um, allowing us to have the full link redundancy. So this is essentially layer one redundancy. Um, so the next piece is the, uh, the gateway. So we discussed the various VLANs at the site. And before you put the firewall in place, the default gateway is likely on what we call a sub interface um, on the switch stack, okay? So nice. it's basically, um, the the front door that you would you would have to go to default gateway to get out of that network. So think of the workstation going to the server. It's going to go to the, um, the 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 switch virtual interface. It's going to say, "Hey, I'm going to this network," and it's essentially getting routed at that point. Right. So, in order to wedge the firewall inside that network, the firewall has to take the duty of the default gateway. Okay. Um, this is in a layer three mode, obviously. Um, if you could do a virtual wire, um, that would be great. But in, in this design, which we're showing you today, we're actually taking the default gateway from the switch stack and sticking right. it on the firewall. What this allows you to do is because we're now the default gateway, we're actually seeing broadcast traffic. We're actually seeing everything coming in and going out of that VLAN. So we're seeing the quote unquote inner VLAN routing. And we're also seeing anything leaving the network as well very very powerful because once we're in this in this uh area of the network now we're actually seeing not only the full visibility but now we can build policy saying this zone to that zone can use these apps um, this zone to that zone gets full threat inspection this zone to that zone we can do ssl tls decryption right so lots right. of power once we're in this area of the network so um so now that we're you know full link redundancy um now that we're um, considering taking the default gateway, how do we actually do that? So what you do is you leverage VLAN tags using 8021Q trunking technology. And as you can see on my diagram here, AE1 has various sub interfaces. So those sub interfaces are the default gateway of these VLANs. 
As you can see, each subinterface has a security zone associated. Um, I have some lab servers, some lab workstations, but you can consider this, you know, workstations or servers or IoT devices. Um, and then from there, when you build your actual PanelOS security policies, you reference these zones, you reference these networks in your policy. Uh, the beauty here is now um, that we're the default gateway. Um, again, we're seeing the, the traffic, but um, we also need the ability to have full um, appliance redundancy, right? One appliance isn't right. enough, we need two. So with PanOS, we can configure high availability. And high availability, there's different ways to, to deploy high availability. You can do active, active, active standby, et cetera. In my lab, I'm configured in a active standby. So in PanOS, you have the ability to say, this is the active firewall, this is the standby firewall. And as you can see, my standby firewall in the diagram has the same interfaces um, configured. Um, right. If you go to my actual switch and look at my switch, you know I have a port channel configured, I have my VLANs on the switch, um, but again, the gateway is up at the firewall. So let's say the active firewall were to go down, right? You would want the high availability to fail over to the standby firewall. Uh, what's interesting is that standby firewall, because it's in a passive state, it's not actually taking traffic. So in your passive firewall, you can actually do things like pre-negotiate the port channel. So it's technically already up and ready to go and take the traffic. Um, but if the firewall in the active state were to go down, the standby firewall immediately takes over the, the, the traffic flows. Same policy because that's uh, synchronized between the active standby pair. Um, and it's able to essentially pick up without skipping a beat. All the sessions are synchronized via the uh, HA between the boxes. You're making the network team very happy because you're not in introducing downtime, right? So. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the long and the short of it is um, you're, you're essentially keeping the same network design, the same VLANs, the same prefixes, all those things. You're essentially literally deleting the sub interface on your switch stack, your switch virtual interface on your switch stack, you're moving it to a sub interface on a on Apollo next generation firewall, and you're accomplishing the full HA via active standby configuration, and then also link redundancy for cables, just in case cables are unplugged, and then also achieving HA via power. So we're not going to talk about high availability today. But just so you guys are aware, there are some high availability concepts within PanOS. There's HA1 and HA2. HA1 is essentially going to do configuration sync and HA2 is essentially going to do your uh, session sync, right. right? So as sessions go through the active firewall, you want those sessions to be um, synchronized to the, the, stand the standby firewall. And that's essentially how that's accomplished. So let's go ahead and pivot to an actual configuration. But before we do, um, this image on the bottom of this diagram is actually my lab. I posted this on LinkedIn. I got a lot of feedback. A lot of people commented and liked it. I was like a social media celebrity for like a day. <laughs> you went viral. People love, <laughs> yeah, people love seeing this stuff um, because this is actually something you'd have to do, right? Um, and I've actually done this um, myself actually as a customer. Um, is deploy these things in HA and then basically, you know, check all the boxes for HA and make everybody happy. Right. So let's go ahead and pivot to um, my my firewalls. Okay. So this is a you know a live panorama. This is my template. Um, we're not again. We're, so we're not going to get into templates today, but basically, if you think of this at scale, right? This is the branch design. <clears throat> I want to basically replicate this at all the different sites. You can use templates and template stacks to accomplish that. Um, so I actually have several customers that do this um, at scale. They have you know hundreds of branch sites and they're doing network segmentation using PanOS with their next generation firewall. The beauty is um, you know each branch is built differently. Some are large, some are small. So it really doesn't matter if you deploy a PA800 series or a PA3200 series or larger. Um, all of these concepts are the same. Um, some of the larger firewalls will have different HA ports, um, but it's all accomplished via templates and template stacks within Panorama to, to scale this out. So this right. is the live, the live view here. Um, basically, um, 
when you configure your sub interfaces, your port aggregate stuff, it's all under the network tab under your interfaces. <clears throat> and this is how it's accomplished. Um, now, if I actually take a look at my um, panorama summary, um, I have an HA pair here. Mm -hmm. This is the active, this is the passive. Um, another beauty of doing it this way is uh, when you do upgrades. So um, when I go to upgrade my branch, I can upgrade my firewalls. And because they're an active standby, I can actually upgrade the passive, do a failover without dropping a packet, and then upgrade you know, the passive firewall again. And you can leave it that way or move it back, depending on how you want to um, operate. But the long story short is now you have operational HA because you don't have to take the branch down to do an upgrade, right? You have full active standby. You can do upgrades without dropping packets. Right. Very nice. Awesome. So that really covers it for us today. Um, again, you know, the reason why you would want to do something like this is because with with the threat landscape the way that it is today, um, a lot of a lot of companies will get hit with something like ransomware, and then you'll have cross lateral movement. So you'll have things like the SMB protocol spreading a malicious payload throughout the environment. So like the workstation to the servers, the servers to the servers, etc. And basically when you have something like this, like a segmentation gateway, if you want to think of it that way, you have the full visibility as to uh, what the traffic is, but then you can take a deeper uh, look into the content of what the actual application is transmitting and actually take action if it's a threat. The last thing you want is cross-lateral movement, not only if someone's in the network poking around, but also right. if, if there's some sort of like worm or some kind of um, you know, spreading happening. Um, I've actually received feedback from a couple companies that actually implemented something like this. And mm -hmm. they've actually seen a device get hit and the segmentation gateway prevent the cross lateral movement of, of the malware. So this is real, this does work. And this does accomplish all the little um, needs and desires of, of your network team uh, when you come to them saying, hey, this is what I wanna do. Right. Yeah. You, you need to reduce your attack surface. That's what you all need to do. You don't want to have a flat network where everything is vulnerable. However, as you pointed out, when we don't, uh, or we do segment, we tend to lose visibility and ability to react. So this gives us the best of both, which is really what we're looking for. Absolutely. All right. So that'll do it for episode 35. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back with the next episode soon. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks.